Friends, these are crazy times. Each day, the news tells us of something new that can scare us, that can concern us, that can break our hearts. As I said in my midweek newsletter article, even the most creative science fiction writer couldn't come up with all the things that are happening at the same time here in our country and in our world. And so I feel the need this morning to address what's going on in our country directly and from a theological and Christian standpoint. So what we're going to do this morning is take a brief one-week break from our narrative lectionary. We will get back on it next week when we begin the first summer series a five-week series in the book of Job. But this week, I feel the need to stop for a minute and think through with you what is going on and how we can respond. So yes, friends, this morning we're going to talk about race. But rather than look back and judge the past, even though I think that is an important part of what we need to do, what I want to do this morning is to make some suggestions of what I think God might be calling us to do in order to help us move forward into a future that is more consistent with God's call on our lives. But before I get fully into what I want to say today, let me say a few words about that last phrase that I used about moving forward into a future that God is calling us to, a future more consistent with God's kingdom. In my attempts to be a good listener this past week, I came across a United Methodist pastor whose name is Jasper Peters. And Peters was talking about his struggles with the words racial reconciliation. He suggests that the problem with that phrase is that in order to be reconciled with someone, there must be a time in the past when you had a good relationship with them. Reconciliation literally means a movement back towards a time of a conciliatory moment. Peters argues that there has never been a time when people of different races, at least in this country, have had a truly peaceful relationship with each other. So to use the word reconciliation makes it seem like we have to go back to a time of peace. A time that never existed. Rather than focusing on doing the work to move forward into something new. And so throughout our conversation this morning, I want us to continually be thinking about how do we move forward? And what role can we play as followers of Jesus? I'm not going to make a political argument this morning, although obviously political conversations need to be had. What I'm going to do instead is present through Scripture, what I believe to be the proper Christian posture at this time in our country. We're going to use the words of Micah chapter 6 to identify that posture. So let's listen now to Micah chapter 6, 6 through 8, with special attention to the last verse. With what shall I come before the Lord and and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's explore that last sentence through the lens of this past week. Do justice. First of all, notice it says do justice. There's action required here, not just good thoughts. This isn't an intellectual understanding of justice, but rather a a putting of justice into action. So what is justice? Justice is a couple of different things. There are a few different connotations to that word. Often justice is thought of as a proper punishment for a crime that has been committed. Uh, an administration of the law in a proper way. Justice can also be thought of as, as conformity to the truth, to fact or reason. But I think the most compelling understanding of justice in this text for this week, for this time, is that justice means fairness. Friends, it is hard to look at the reality of our country and say that fairness has been achieved. Fairness is an ideal that we have been striving for since the beginning of this country, and in many ways, I will admit, we have come a long way. But the simple fact is that black and brown people have a harder time in our country. Can they be successful? Absolutely. But they have to work so much harder to get there. Are there struggles and difficulties for white people? Obviously. But the struggles for people of color are more prevalent and harder to overcome. We can argue all day about the extent of that difficulty or the reasons behind it, but when we do that, I think we miss the point. And the reality is, even if we don't understand that to be true from our own experience, if we take the time to really listen to people of color, we will hear that that is their experience. And so we must believe them and take their experience into consideration. So what does it look like to do justice, to to put fairness into action? It looks like taking a hard look at all of our systems and making sure that they are in fact fair for everyone. Things like education and health care and providing positive role models and providing quality food and providing safety and protection for all people. Those are the kind of things that we need to be pushing our leaders to think hard about 
and that we need to be entering into conversation about. God calls us to do justice, to make sure that we work within our society to assure that all people have the same opportunity to grow and thrive in this world. Let me say something really important. Justice for people of color does not mean a lack of justice for those of us whose skin is lighter. God is calling for justice for everyone. And so we must look at our systems. But we also must look at our hearts. We must look deep inside our souls and see where we have allowed prejudice of any kind to take hold and to impact the way we behave in this world and be willing to do the hard work that it takes to change our hearts and our souls. Do justice. Love kindness. Now this one seems much easier and more straightforward than the last, but but is it really? It doesn't just say be kind, it says love kindness. I think there's something deeper there. When when we love something, it it becomes a part of us. It, It finds its way into our heart and soul, into our very being. So to love kindness means that kindness becomes the motivation to all of our words and all of our actions. That means we are kind even with people who disagree with us. That means we are kind when we think those on the other side are not being very kind. I saw this in action on Tuesday night of this past week. I found myself down on the square, mostly observing, but also participating in a rally that was organized by the youth of our community. In the midst of that rally, of young people crying out for justice, particularly justice for black lives. One person came into the midst and tried to stir it up, tried to yell at the crowd different arguments and get it started. And I'll tell you what, when that happened, there was this instinct in the crowd to fight back to yell louder, to to put their signs in front of her signs. You could see an aggressive move forward beginning to happen. A unkind response seemed appropriate. But then one of the adults who helped these young people organize this march stepped up to the microphone and reminded them that they had chosen before this event started that it was going to be a peaceful event, that they were going to let people speak. And while he didn't say these words, what he told them was that they had decided to love kindness that night. And those young people heard him, and they took a deep breath, and they stepped back, and they allowed the love of kindness to be what flowed over the square. Friends, we are called to love kindness as we face these difficult conversations. Finally, we're called to walk humbly with our God. Maybe that doesn't feel like it applies to the current moment as much as the other two, but 
but perhaps it's the most important. Humility requires understanding that, that you might not have it all figured out. That I might not have it all figured out. That, that my answers might not be the only ones. That my perspective might need to be reconsidered based on someone else's experience. Humility can be scary because it might force us to see that we have been wrong. It might convict us. It might challenge us. Push us to action. But notice again, it doesn't just say be humble, but rather walk humbly with our God. There's a movement in this humility. It's a walking, a a working on it, not just sitting in our comfort zone. And we don't walk alone. We walk with God. A God who we can trust to guide us to protect us, to inspire us along the way. So what am I suggesting this morning? I'm asking each of us, and I say us on purpose because I am committing myself to this also. I ask each of us to stop for a minute to put down some of the assumptions with which we enter into this conversation. To listen to others. To be willing to learn and grow. To know that others' experiences are different from ours and that we can all grow if we share together. Perhaps one of the best examples of that has been all across our country during these pro- when these protests are happening. We're now seeing images and videos of, of protesters and police officers sharing with each other their own pain, their own difficult experience. And we can hope that they're learning from each other how to be more just. I'm challenging us to watch movies, to read books, to listen to podcasts that might show us this conversation from the other side. And I'm working on finding those resources for myself and would love to share any of them with any of you that would like to enter in. I'm suggesting that we need to be honest about our own fears and our own struggles. To realize that doing justice might require some hard conversations and moments of great pain and struggle. Suggesting that we need to let the love of kindness be the defining characteristic of all of our words and all of our actions. And I'm suggesting that we need to humbly let God guide our steps into a new future where all of God's children are given the opportunity to grow and to thrive. And to God be all the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.